PTL webinar series. These series um, evolve from sessions that were held by the PTLs regarding updates to their projects at each summit, and we've converted them into webinars to extend that reach beyond the summit. Um, with us today, um, we have John Dickinson, PTL for Object Storage, and Robert Collins, PTL for Provisioning. Each one will speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we can take your questions in between and at the end. So with that, I will get going, and I will pull up John's presentation. John, when you're ready, we're ready for you. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here, and I'm glad that we get to participate in these webinar series. Uh, one of my favorite times of every summit so far uh, until we started these webinar series was always giving the state of the project talk and being able to basically brag on the community and see what's going on. And so now doing that in the webinar series has always been is, is becoming the new way to do that. And it's, uh, it's really exciting. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Dickinson. I'm the Project Technical Lead for OpenStack Object Storage. Uh, you can find me online. Uh, my Twitter handle is not my name. Uh, you can send me an email at me, dot, uh, not, me at not.mn um, and uh, various other places. Um, so today I want to talk about what we've been doing uh, since the Ice House release and what you can expect in Juno and what's going on there. So next slide. So the basic reality that we're all familiar with is that storage is a problem and it has to be solved. There is a ton of data that we're all generating and that our users are all generating and the applications that we're writing are uh, now cross-platform uh, cross as in like uh, moving from different devices and uh, users are demanding uh, their data being portable, portably accessible across their desktops from home to office to phones to tablets to all of these things. And all of these new applications, uh, in addition, are just generating a tremendous amount of storage uh, just, uh, with documents, videos, um, user-generated content. And it doesn't matter where you are or what you're writing, but this is a problem that has to be solved. So we have to have a good solution for it. Next slide. So the the, the change that's happened here is that uh, we're con when confronted with this, uh, this massive problem of storage growth, growth in the storage requirements, we realize we have to change a little bit about how storage is provisioned and how it is, uh, how it is deployed in an organization. Used to, you need an application, you write an application, and you provision some storage for it, and the next application comes along and you do the same thing. That gives you a lot of siloed storage. And that becomes a little bit uh, tricky to, uh, to uh, take advantage of some of the economies of scale of pooled storage. Uh, hard to provision and use, uh, silos are hard to provision and use effectively. So what we need is some sort of scalable infrastructure to deal with that. And ideally, what you really want is to be able to do that in a way that you don't have a particular hardware lock-in uh, so that you can uh, change and grow and adapt over time. Next slide. So the other thing we realize is that we also need a lot of agility with our storage. We, from the, from the ops perspective, you want to be able to automatically work around failures. You want to be able to do seamless upgrades. You need to be able to do capacity adjustments uh, on the fly. Uh, and then just from the, or the organization overall, you have to be able to match the storage to the use case. Uh, it, it, when, you, when you have a use case that says, you know, this is going to be high throughput or this is going to be large volumes of data, your storage system is going to work best when you're able to actually configure your storage to, uh, to specifically solve those problems. And so what we need is not to make the applications worry about what particular hard drive you're storing it on or how to actually uh, effectively store the data uh, to prevent uh, uh, operational error, you know, uh, hardware failure, and things like that. You need a system for your storage that can decouple your data from the actual storage media that it is on. And this is what Swift does. This is, this is why Swift is useful and why you get uh, such great uh, economies of scale and uh, throughput and uh, efficiency when uh, using Swift 
as a storage, uh, storage engine for your uh, growing unstructured data. So next slide. So overall, as a summary, what does SWIFT provide? Looking at three different people. If you've got, if, if you're the enterprise IT uh, organization, what you get is you get a shared pool of storage that gives you a, uh, a flat namespace that allows you to have a uh, uh, to consolidate your store your, your storage requirements um, and uh, take advantage of uh, the cost savings you can do for that. The the no the no lock in allows it to be very flexible as far as how you're going to uh, grow your storage going forward. Now, if you're the if you're the ops guy, then uh, your day-to-day -day operations uh, is smoothed out by being able to run Swift. So you're able to do things like automatic failure handling. Uh, hardware filters are normal and expected things that Swift automatically works around uh, and adjusts for, um, as well as uh, automatic or not automatic, but uh, smooth uh, capacity adjustments, meaning that you can change both up and down the amount of storage provisioned without having to worry about turning off the system or having any sort of uh, end user client downtime. And then uh, being able to do in place rolling upgrades throughout your entire cluster, again, without having to have any kind of uh, client uh, downtime or interruption of service. Uh, these sort of things uh, we, uh, automatic are, are built into the system and they let you, uh, as uh, someone who is running and operating and deploying uh, Swift, uh, makes the day-to-day -day operations easier. Now, as far as the application use case, the, uh, the end user application, um, the, the storage, the, the things that we all know and love, the things that you're using to actually take your pictures and upload them someplace and, and watch the videos and stuff like that. Uh, the hard problems that we have, uh, uh, Swift takes over the hard problems of storage away from the application. Um, those hard problems generally all have to do with scale. Where do you put stuff? How do you manage your access to it? Uh, and uh, with Swift, since Swift is able to offload those hard problems away from the application, uh, the application developers can think about making the, the app awesome and not having to worry about uh, dealing with nuances of storage or uh, wrestling with its particular limitations of a particular uh, protocol or uh, you know, the, the, the storage media itself. And so those are the things that you get from uh, running Swift, uh, both you know, from the the ops perspective, from the enterprise perspective, and from the uh, developer perspective. Next slide. So what's going on in Swift? What have we been working on? And uh, what are we looking at working on over the next several months as we uh, finish up the OpenStack Juno cycle? So there's a couple of major things uh, that I'm going to talk about. And these are storage policies and erasure codes in Swift. Next slide. Storage policies. I think are the biggest thing that has ever happened to uh, in Swift since the whole project was open source. Uh, storage policies um, allow you to exactly match your storage to your use case. It's organized storage. So, in a nutshell, what storage policies give you is that, given your global hardware footprint of your Swift cluster, then you are able to choose what subset of hardware is storing your data, and then what, uh, how the data is stored across that subset of data. So if you know something about the internals of Swift, uh, storage policies allow for multiple object rings in the same cluster. So let me go into a little more detail about how that actually works and some of those uh, use cases uh, to really just kind of uh, bring that home. First off, uh, storage policies has introduced a slightly new API uh, perspective, and it's extremely simple. It's the next slide. Um, storage policies uh, are uh, configured by the deployer, uh, the operator of the cluster, and so a cluster uh, operator may uh, create and provision, say, a gold, silver, and bronze storage policy, or maybe you know the tuna fish and cupcake storage policy, or, or whatever else they want to do. And then when the client uh, ends up setting that, um, or creating a new container inside of Swift, the client will send one extra header, the X storage policy header, and give it the name of the storage policy that they want that container to be. And that's it. Uh, it is, uh, there's nothing uh, new, nothing, uh, nothing else that has been changed in the API to support this. Uh, it means that, um, I thought I guess with some reporting information. 
but it means that all existing clients continue to work with Swift seamlessly, um, and there's no backwards incompatible changes here. But all new clients that want to take advantage of this functionality now have the ability to easily uh, create new storage, pol uh, new containers uh, in different storage policies. So let's talk a little bit about the use cases on the next slide about how uh, storage policies um, I see have uh, already. Uh, are being used and have been uh, talked about being used, and maybe some uh, possibilities for the future. So uh, there's a few really interesting uh, things that I can think of uh, for storage policies. Uh, one of which is that, um, well, I guess to back up just a little bit, remember storage policies allow you to choose your subset of hardware and then the, uh, how to store your data across that subset of hardware. So first, with that first part, you can choose your subset of data, uh, subset of hardware, uh, for example, based on a geographic region or a particular performance tier, you know, SSD versus hard, spinning hard drives. Uh, and you can choose, uh, when you're going to choose how you store your data across a particular um, set of hardware, then you, may choose, you can choose the replication policy that is used. So by default, we normally recommend that people use a triple replication scheme inside of Swift. Uh, but maybe that's not right for every use case. Perhaps you want something that is just two replicas. And I think this is the first obvious example of where storage policies become really uh, useful. Uh, imagine you're doing uh, video transcoding. You've got your gold master image uh, that's you know, multiple gigabytes um, stored in your Swift cluster. Uh, and it's really important that you keep that with both high durability and availability. So you want to put that in something that has a triple replicated policy. But if you're transcoding that video and you want to make it available, for example, on different, uh, different mobile devices, different, uh, different bit rates, things like that, um, it's really nice to keep those available so you don't have to recompute that on every request. But if you lost that particular transcoded copy, it's not the end of the world because you can recreate it. So in that case, you can save some money potentially on your storage costs by uh, provisioning a reduced redundancy storage policy. Say just use two replicas. And in that way, you can store all of the transcoded video or perhaps your, your image thumbnails or uh, something else that's, again, recreatable in a reduced redundancy uh, uh, storage policy. And so this is something that I expect people to uh, very quickly write and deploy and something that you could, uh, you could use today uh, with storage policies in Swift. Another uh, very um, obvious use case with storage policies is taking advantage of being able to choose that uh, subset of hardware uh, and being able to designate that either on a, um, a regional setting or potentially on a, uh, a performance setting. So on the uh, regional setting, you can imagine that uh, if you've got a globally distributed Swift cluster, um, which you, you've been able to do for uh, about a year now in Swift, uh, what you could do is have a, an East Coast and a West Coast United States uh, location, and also perhaps a, a, an EU and an Asia location. And uh, what Swift has uh, done up until this point is simply distribute your data with as many replicas as you have configured across that entire global footprint. But not all data needs to be accessed equally in all places. And some data only needs to be in certain locations. So. Uh, because of uh, potential laws and uh, rules and regulations and things like that. So uh, one thing you can do is you can configure different storage policies to de uh, uh, designate different regions. For example, you could say, um, I've got a set of, of uh, branch offices and each or, or maybe edge locations uh, throughout the world, and I need to make sure that I have um, a copy of my data on the edge. For example, let's say I have an office in New York and an office in LA. Um, but then my headquarters is in, um, I don't know, let's just say Denver. In that case, maybe you'll have uh, data that is uh, stored uh, and accessed both in, uh, just in New York, and you have different data that's stored and accessed just in LA. But you can create a storage policy such that the data that is stored in New York also will always have a copy in the home office in Denver. And likewise, for the LA office, we'll always have a a, a gold master copy, so to speak, in the Denver office in the home office there. What this means is you can imagine that you've got um, the data that um, is pertinent to a particular geographic location, for example, here the, the New York or LA, um, would live in that location, and that gives you good um, locality of access, which you know, increases throughput and reduces latency. Uh, but it also means that you have 
uh, your copy back at the home office in Denver, um, but you don't have to worry about going all the way to LA to, to store that data and access that data every time you try to do it. So it really allows you to have a lot more efficient control over how or where in the world your data is placed. Obviously, you can imagine some other things about saying, I need to have certain sets of data that, for example, only live inside of Germany and never leave uh, and, and traverse the, the Atlantic and, and come to the United States or something like that. So uh, those are uh, some examples of how you could uh, carve up your uh, switch clusters to uh, enable some storage policies across uh, different uh, uh, geographies. Um, and you could clearly do the same thing by um, uh, using different performance tiers, SLA uh, uh, requirements uh, for uh, different kinds of hardware. Speaking of the different kinds of hardware, there's some other things that have been very uh, interesting happening in the community along those lines of storage policies is that um, there's been several companies, uh, HP and uh, Red Hat included, uh, that have been developing um, some, uh, some plugins for Swift to allow uh, them to take advantage of either a particular storage engine, uh, for example, like uh, Gluster or Ceph, or to take advantage of particular hardware, for example, in the case of uh, HP. And uh, they offer um, something over and above um, uh, or just something that is uh, not available out of the box with Swift. And so uh, what you can do is you could be able to, for example, configure a storage policy that says, you know, I'm going to have this set of hardware is going to be running, uh, or th this, this set of data inside of Swift is going to be available on this set of hardware. And um, that allows uh, the vendors to come in and offer either their own open or proprietary uh, extensions to Swift and take advantage of their own, uh, their own technologies that they are developing. And then what, else, what other kind of things can we do with storage policies? I think this is where, this is where you come in, and this is where um, I'm excited to see uh, how people end up using this power, these powerful tools. Um, I can, there's obvious things that people can do along the lines of encryption and, uh, and, and compression and things like that. Uh, but I think there's also some very interesting uh, things I've heard about, say, um, I need a storage policy that offers, for example, very low jitter rates on, for video streaming. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you could uh, uh, preferentially store, say, video content in your low jitter storage policy and not have to worry about that on your, your storage policy that's designed for, for backups. So overall, I'm really excited about the, uh, the possibilities that storage policies allows. This is something that actually just last Friday was merged into Swift. We're currently uh, doing uh, some, some community QA work on it right now. Um, and it is going to be available for the world within the uh, Open Static Juno cycle. So next slide. Now the next big thing that is happening inside of, uh, inside of Swift and the thing that we are working on uh, for the rest, or one of the major things that we're working on for the rest of the Juno cycle is uh, creating a storage policy that, that is a non-replicated storage. Uh, we're going to uh, be able to allow deployers to set, um, um, set a storage policy that would be erasure coding data. If you're not familiar with erasure coding, uh, basically it's a way to take your data and then uh, break it up into chunks, com mathematically compute a few extra chunks, and then store all of those chunks in such a way that you can survive the loss of quite a few of them. And the real advantage of this is that uh, although it does uh, cost some extra CPU to, um, to compute uh, the, uh, the needed bits for erasure codes, you can get very high durability uh, without having, say, the overhead of triple replication. So you may, be, you may even be able to get down to, say, you know, a, a 1.4 or uh, to 1.5x uh, overhead rather than a full 3x overhead for triple replication. Uh, this is something that uh, it is an active area of work, and um, it, it will consume a lot of time, uh, a lot of dead time within the Juno cycle. And I hope it makes it inside of the Juno cycle, but we're not really committed to that date right now. Um, I'm, I'm more, it's more likely that it's going to be uh, closer to the end of this year. Um, and so just in a very practical sense, one reason I'm really happy about it is that it gives a better fit for some common use cases at Swift, uh, specifically when people are storing very large 
data that doesn't have very high access rates. Uh, things like backups and image storage, especially when it comes to in, uh, integrating with the other OpenStack projects. Next slide. So we'll be working on these things quite a bit, and um, there's obviously these are not the only things that we'll be doing in uh, the rest of the genome cycle. Uh, some of the other active areas uh, of work include uh, specifically looking at some performance and efficiency uh, improvements, and we've got some exciting things uh, in progress there. Um, and um, overall, uh, we've got a, a great community that has uh, been built over the years and is continuing to uh, participate, uh, but we would love for you to get involved as well. Um, if you have any questions or want to get involved, uh, please reach out to myself or uh, get a, uh, reach us on uh, OpenStack Swift on Freenode uh, IRC. Uh, take a look at the OpenStack Getting Started pages, and uh, swift.openstack.org is where you can find a lot of the the Swift developer documentation. Um, so I think I have some time for uh, a couple of questions. I'm just looking over the chat uh, now. Right. Yeah, and you can see whether I got the answers right or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, storage policies are in master right now. Um, the use case with transcoding with storage policies um, would be, for example, a reduced redundancy storage policy. You would want to um, uh, you would want to be able to uh, store your gold master uh, video, for example, at triple replica, um, and then you could store the transcoded uh, copies and reduce redundancy, which just allows you to save some space. Um, and then that last question there, talking about which sort of uh, erasure codes we'll be supporting, um, and Robert was absolutely right. There's a, uh, a, a library uh, that's being developed in conjunction uh, with this effort called PyECLib. Uh, which essentially is a pluggable interface to uh, uh, different erasure code libraries. The advantage of this is it means we don't, we're not just supporting one particular erasure code. Um, and given the realities of the legal landscape around erasure codes, it means that those who uh, want to use something that they may have access to but is not generally accessible, um, it, it is absolutely possible for them to take advantage of that. Uh, one piece of um, one interesting piece around this is that Intel is an active participant uh, within the Swift community here and is uh, working on um, and integrating their um, ISA-L uh, erasure code library that is optimized for working on their processors. Uh, so basically it's a very pluggable thing. Um, we'll have some things that will work out of the box for you, but uh, it's also configurable to something that you may need. Are there uh, any other questions before we uh, move on to Robert and get to the end? You've got them. Great. Okay, well then thank you, John. And if we have more questions, we can see if we have time at the end as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Robert, one second. Let me just get you loaded up. Yeah. Cool. One sec. There we go. Great. All set. When you're ready, Robert. Thank you. And Right, like John, I'm, I'm very glad to be given this update. It's, it's actually really nice to be able to take the time after the summit to pull our thoughts together because the summit is just so crazy busy. Um, so I'm Robert Collins. I'm the project technical lead or program technical lead for Triple O, and um, you can reach me on Twitter or my corporate emails there, or just the email I use on the list is fine as well. Although. You know, if you want my attention, probably corporate email, it gets way less mail. And I, I like it that way, so that's not necessarily an advice to spam me. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. In fact, probably skip over that one, it's just, you know, boilerplate. So, um, much more boring slides than John's. I apologize for that, but. For an update, I think probably I would have run several hours if I tried to do an in-depth slide deck. So instead, I'm just going to run bullet points. So in IceHouse, we had working deployment of clouds, fully functional, but not with all the bells and whistles. We had Debian, Fedora, RHEL, SLES, and Ubuntu support, and all the major components, Solomato, Glance, Heat, etc. We deployed using Nova Bare Metal and we had experimental ironic support. Single control node, um, single node control plane, no HA, 
And one of the big things that we got done during the ice house cycle was we got CI checking of everything going into the tree up and running. We didn't have comprehensive coverage, but we've come a long way from, yeah, it worked for me, we'll get it checked in. And that's a, a key part of the maturity in the OpenStack community is getting good CI in place. Unlike uh, most of the projects in OpenStack, we can't use the DevStack VM uh, tooling because we're doing the deployment itself, and DevStack is a different deployment technology. We wouldn't actually be testing anything that's relevant for Triple O if we did that. So we've got a custom rig that depends on running things that look like bare metal. So they boot off PXE, they have dedicated bare metal networks, um, and that's got a bunch of investment in it. Long term, and this is something that we'll, we want to try and do during Juno, we want to be able to turn any um, production Nova environment into a emulated bare metal test rig. So we need to add some features to Nova and Neutron to support this, and that would let us reduce the, the friction involved and get us more into the sort of mainline test infrastructure. So in Juno, we're specifically expecting to bring on two new regions, the HP2 region and a, and a Huawei region. Um, these are being donated um, in much the same way that the regular infra VMs are donated um, as part of these companies' contributions to OpenStack. We want to increase the robustness of our CI, so we need better services in each region. Uh, we need mirrors of the distros that we build on and caches of PyPy and tarballs and all of that sort of stuff. Um, these things make a huge difference in the reliability and performance of uh, O. We recommend deployers put them in place to make their local builds fast, so we need to have them for CI as well. Um, we're looking to collaborate with Infra on exactly how that's done. Maybe it's uh, deployed by Infra, run by Infra, or maybe they're deployed as part of the O plumbing in that cloud. We desperately need to increase our coverage. We need to run Tempest on each deployed cloud, and we need to test the upgrades really do work. Um, we already catch some interesting things. Uh, we caught a neutron bug last week that because we've got multi-node testing, it's all, all of our tests are multi-node. Um, and once we get upgrade testing in place, I'm sure we'll bring similar benefits. Um, it will be somewhat different to Grenade, and hopefully we'll find different edge cases. Um, we need to, uh, we're looking to, and we need to increase our integration with the regular infra uh, data mining on CI. Now that's mainly about conserving resources. It, we've got a limited number of resources. Um, we often have queue times when we've got a lot of activity going on, a lot of development going on, and if people are retesting to find out if something was a spurious failure or a genuine failure, it consumes a significant amount of resources. So if we can say quite accurately, this is, this is a spurious failure, it's okay to recheck it, um, that's useful because we can then say only ever recheck if you're absolutely sure it's spurious. And the other thing it does is it gives us guidance about what spurious failures we need to track down and fix, what race conditions we're running into. Um, we also need to monitor the regions because we had a whole bunch of trouble with the HP1 region due to Mellanox uh, firmware versions causing packet loss and it would drop off. We wouldn't be able to talk to it from the infra no pool and eventually the, we'd just not be running tests at all. So it was not making good use of the hardware. So we want to get on top of those things and be able to pinpoint when things go wrong in a much more aggressive fashion than we were. Pretty standard ops stuff, to be honest. Um, lastly, this is what I mentioned just before. Um, we want to do quintuple O. So we want to go run triple O on Nova or on OpenStack. Slide, please. So the next big thing we've got over the Juno cycle is bringing our HA story along. So in this iteration, we're aiming for a single component failure tolerance. So we're not aiming for auto healing, and we're not aiming for two node failures. Um, the plan is that we're going to default to a three node control plane. 
So unless you explicitly ask for a single no, we'll give you AJ. That'll be the default. All services, uh, I say all, but I think Rabbit is going to be the exception, but everything but Rabbit and but local SSH to the machines, everything else we will access via virtual IP only. HA proxy will be listening on the virtual IP, S tunnel will be listening on the local node, and um, the actual service itself will only be listening on local host. So that gives us quite a good security story. Everything will be SSL, which is uh, great from a security perspective. It's perhaps not the best thing from an HTTP uh, performance perspective. So if there are things where um, people really want to run an HTTP version of it, perhaps Swift public object comes to mind, um, we'll have to have a, that particular service listening on the node local IP, not just on local host. Um, but at the moment, we, we don't intend to do that. We're going to see how far we can get with a single design. Um, Galera is going to be the, the initial implementation of Cluster Database. Um, like everything else, we're, we're extremely happy for it to be pluggable, but we in the community are just going to get one up and running and then move on to other interesting problems. Um, we'll still be able to deploy a single node uh, control plane, but um, yeah, that's really about the size of that for HA. Oh, slide please. Sorry. All right. So for upgrades, um, Triple O, because it deploys to physical machines, and because we're using Golden Images, which is the sort of default language of an OpenStack environment, image-based um, snapshots and so on. We need some way of preserving the data when we upgrade the software on a machine. So we put that into a separate partition on slash mount slash state. We need to finish making sure that all of the data we want to persist during an upgrade is actually being recorded on slash mount slash state rather than somewhere on you know slash var slash lib or something like that. Um, we're going to be getting rolling upgrades. We've got a lot of it in place, but again, this is something we'll, we'll be finishing during Juno. So when you do an upgrade, it won't take the whole cluster down, it'll just take one node at a time. And we need to have the upgrade will only proceed if Rabbit and Galera are in sync. So if we have an inconsistent cluster state, it will stop and let somebody fix it before it continues. Um, it's not entirely clear how we're going to do the really precise sequencing that Nova needs for upgrades. Uh, from an ops perspective, they have a, a clear but non-trivial story and we need to figure out how to get heat to be able to work that state machine. Um, all of, there are multiple different ways that we want to be able to do upgrades eventually. We need to be able, we'd like to be able to do it online where we don't reboot the node and we just take the image, unpack it on a, a glance server somewhere and then sync it down so that lots of machines can benefit from it being unpacked just once. Um, we want to be able to do multicast upgrades and things like that, but right now the very first iteration is just going to be a Nova rebuild with the preserve ephemeral, which will preserve that mount state partition for us. Um, it's quite likely we'll be able to get a first iteration of the no reboot story in place, and that's particularly useful for the case where we're dealing with a security bug in, say, um, Nova or something. We don't need to re reboot the kernel, we just need to restart the service with a new version of the code on it. Um, but the first iteration of it won't be pretty, but it will be a lot faster than a full rebuild. Next slide, please. Um, so our third big theme is we need to get much broader coverage. So we don't currently have scripts to deploy Trove, Solem, or Mistral. Um, we need to add, I think Designate just got into being a incubator project now, so we need to add that to the things we support installing. We need to add monitoring as a default in, a thing in the environment rather than something that people are adding in as an external facility. It's kind of the core thing for any cloud. Um, next slide. So Tuscar is the triple O API. It's 
a, a stateless server that aims to provide the logic that we run on an administrative node or an administrator's machine in a central place, which allows multiple administrators to um, add in the same cluster without having local state of their own that they can lose or um, have to synchronize between machines or have a dedicated machine that's not installed through the same tooling that they have to put it on. So we hope that during Juno Tuscar will be mature enough that we can replace the ad hoc scripts we've got that bring up the undercloud and the overcloud and instead use Tuscar for that. Tuscar's got a, a new leaner model. It's it had some state before. We've stripped that back and we're going to make extensive use of heat provider templates to encapsulate the various roles you have in the cloud. So the control plane will be a provider template. The hypervisor will be a provider template. Um, we're pretty excited about this because this will finally get us to the point where we're collaborating directly on heat rather than layering stuff on top of it. And um, we're, I mean, one of our fundamental founding tenets to Triple O was to have a virtuous circle where we deploy OpenStack as an application on OpenStack and improve OpenStack to make it capable of deploying applications as complex as itself. Um, and we've done that very well in some areas and not so well in others, and each one of the ones we haven't done it as well as we'd like to. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a couple of other interesting things, and the last one is one I'm, I think in some ways the most excited about. So we're going to get rid of these undercloud and overcloud terms. The terms that seem to be sort of gaining uh, consensus are a deployer or deployment cloud and workload clouds. And the distinction, the deployment cloud is the one that you use to deploy your machines. So it's an administrative owned cloud and administrators are the only people that use it. And the workload cloud is the cloud that you deploy using the deployment cloud. Uh, and end users, if you're a public cloud, that would be your actual public cloud. But you might also deploy test clouds, which is distinct from the deployer cloud, um, and does still be workload clouds. The particular workload you'd have there would be if I'm doing a test of something. Um, the last one is the fun one. So this is where we've taken advantage of a bunch of refactoring that's been done in Nova over the last year since we first sort of started looking at things. And it's now possible to run multiple hypervisors that have very different models for allocating resources. So KVM, Docker, and LXC all look pretty much the same from a, an API perspective. You can subdivide a machine. You can split out CPUs and memory and disk any way you want. It's all effectively virtualized. It's certainly all subdividable. But Nova, Bare Metal, or Ironic don't look at all the same because they have to allocate a full machine every time and you can't overcommit. You, that's the machine size, end of story. Because we can now run them in the same Nova scheduler, we can run on the deployment cloud a single Keystone, Nova, Glant, Swift, um, Neutron, and two different Nova computes. We can run the, the ironic Nova compute and we can run a KVM node compute. And that lets us take all of the nodes that we needed to put into the overcloud or the workload cloud control plane and run them virtualized. So instead of having kind of a minimum footprint of, uh, for HA of three machines for your deployment cloud and three machines for your control, plan, control plane and then, you know, the fourth, the, the, sorry, the seventh machine is your first hypervisor you can say, I've got three machines for my undercloud. They have enough KVM capacity on them to run the overcloud control plane, and my fourth machine is my first hypervisor. So for small environments, this is a huge reduction in overhead. For big environments, it all gets lost in the noise. And yes, that is now the, the end. Great. Thanks, Robert. Any questions there? I can't see them because I'm in presentation mode. Let me get back. I can't see any in the chat. 
I was hoping to return the favor to Robert, but nobody asked any questions for me to okay. try to answer. That's impressive that you can answer each other's projects. So. Uh, does anyone else have other questions? I can unmute the line as well. You are now unmuted. Any other questions for John or Robert? Going, going. Okay, well, great. Uh, when you get, uh, when we finish the webinar, you'll receive an email, and you can send us um, as foundation questions too, and I can get that information back to Robert and John as well. So if that's it, then I think we'll conclude. And thanks again, John and Robert, for your time. Um, really appreciate it. And Thank you for the opportunity. Sure. And um, these webinars will be posted to the Foundation channel um, by the end of the week as well, if anyone would like to listen to them again. Have a great, great. day, everyone. Thank you.